Welcome to Head Start, a podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. With races starting to come back and at least a hint of normalcy slowly returning to the endurance events market, it's a good time to take stock of where we currently are on the road to recovery. Are more participants signing up for races? Are they signing up later, as some race directors have suggested? Are in-person races making a strong comeback? And what about virtual races, which dominated events for most of last year? Well, we'll be answering these questions and more today with the help of my guests, Johanna Good and Bob Pickle from Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up. With registration data coming in from thousands of races, Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up is in a pretty unique position to be able to provide actual data-driven insights into what's happening in the market. And as we will see, the conclusions coming out of the data are not always what you'd expect. So, without further ado, let's get into this amazing episode. Johanna, Bob, welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks for having us, Panos. It's good to see you again. Great to be here. So you guys um, are both based in Morristown, New Jersey, where uh, the entire Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up team is based. How are things in New Jersey? It's really hot today. It's about, uh, it's going to go up to 94 today. It's just humid. And we're right outside of Philadelphia, for those that don't know Morristown. And we're actually not all based here. We're a pretty distributed com- company. So we've got a big office down in Richmond. We've got an office down in Orlando. And then we've got uh, talented folks sprinkled across the United <laughs> States. So, Well, it's hot today. And I had to... Uh... I had to get you guys to turn off the air conditioning as well to make this recording well. So so I really appreciate that. So how many people are in the company these days? We're actually up to 62 people. Um, what's kind of amazing is that we, we, last year was a really, really tough year for us. But at the beginning of 2020, we were actually at 45 people. So we've grown during the, during the pandemic era. Um, the, the pandemic was quite difficult for us, you know, in, in third week of March, our revenues had dropped about 80%. So the number of transactions that happened on our platform, and we were worried about the survival of our company. March 13th was Black Friday. And, and we actually, everybody in the company took a 50% pay cut to try to last as long as possible. Fortunately, PPP came along. We were able to reinstore salaries by uh, the middle of March. I am the middle of April, and then um, we pivoted super hard to virtual and challenges. And by the summertime, we are onboarding like 50% more new customers per week. So we are onboarding about 180 new customers per week from August through October, as opposed to 110 the previous year. So like our, the, the, the revenues and the, and the transaction volume was still down considerably, but um, but the fundamentals of our business were actually going pretty well. And uh, so it's it's been an interesting ride. And now we're kind of coming out of it very strongly. So and I'm sure we'll talk about that in today's podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, it's been we've all been through a pretty crazy time. You know, when you were talking about March, April last year, it feels to me like almost like, uh, you know, like 10 years ago or something. But yeah, it's been it's been a hard time. Tell us uh, one more thing that I think is going to be pertinent for today's podcast. How many races are uh, currently hosted on Run Sign Up, uh, roughly? And what percentage of the US market uh, that represents right now? So, you know, in 2019, we had 21,000 races. We actually had about the same number um, last year in 2021. Um, and uh, if you look at, our, at the data that we're utilizing to, to share with you all today, is in Q2, and we just put out a Q2 report, we had just over 10,000 races that actually processed transactions on our platform in 2021, and about the same amount processed transactions in 2019. Right. So the reason I'm asking this is because, um, you know, you guys produce these uh, industry stats um, on an annual basis, hopefully through this podcast, we're going to be able to uh, release snippets of that throughout the year. And the important thing to understand here is that all the numbers we're going to be sharing with people today really come from uh, give sign up, run sign up registrations. These are data that we're going to be sharing anonymously. It's going to be just statistical trends over all those thousands of races that you guys host. But it's important to understand the extent 
of the number of customers that you currently have so that people can appreciate that the numbers we're going to be sharing today are fairly representative of what's happening in the market. Because if we're talking of 10,000 races and upwards of that, and you know, like 30% of the market, I think it's fair to assume that the conclusions we will be drawing today and the numbers we'll be discussing should be considered as broadly representative of what's happening in the market. It's, it's certainly statistically significant. Going into the pandemic, we estimated our market share at 25 to 30%. I think it's uh, going to wind up being closer to 40% post-pandemic. Um, but, uh, and it's representative of small races through large races. So about 25% of the top 100 races use us, um, you know, on down to a lot of 50 person races use us um, just because it's like this self-serve, serve massive platform that, you know, serves thousands and thousands of, 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 uh, of races. Yeah. And that's exactly what we need, actually. I mean, you know, sometimes some of the data we see coming onto the industry, they're a little bit skewed on the upside. Uh, and I think getting the view from a larger number of events that are more representative of the bulk of events that are happening out there is going to be a lot more useful, certainly to the audience of this podcast. So we're going to get into the specifics and the numbers and the data in a second. And I think there's some interesting stuff uh, in that. But before we go into that, you guys work with races sort of all day long. What's the mood out there uh, currently among among the race director community? Is there any kind of optimism coming back to the market? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a ton of optimism um, amongst race directors and also, you know, that we feel ourselves. I think starting back in early 2021, there was some sense that things were going to start to get better. But we've really seen that bounce back, I think, even faster than we were expecting. Um, small races started coming back even, you know, as early as February, March, uh, you start to see some of the smaller races getting permission. We have, you know, now we're looking at the fall with some of the largest races in the country opening back up. Um, some of them have, you know, minor caps, but when you're talking about 20,000 runners versus 30,000 runners, um, it's still huge numbers of runners getting back together. And I think everyone is cautiously optimistic that it's going to last this time. And that even if things go up and down a little bit, uh, races are actually still going to be able to proceed. Hmm. Do you have a feel whether there's any kind of like um, regional differences in this bounce back, you know, particularly depending on the fact that different parts of the U.S. have had, you know, have been have been coming out of lockdown and restrictive measures at different speeds? Do you see parts of the country coming back stronger or sooner than others? Yes, although I think it's less of a factor now than it was, um, you know, looking back earlier in 2020 and 2021, uh, there are still, you know, a little bit of some differences in restrictions. Um, and we do see some things like, you know, uh, the Boilermaker just announced that they're going to be requiring vaccinations. And that's mm -hmm. there in New York State, which is going to be a lot harsher and you know, stricter on how they want things run. Um, that being said, you know, in early 2021, there were states like California that there were no events allowed at all whereas other states were essentially allowing anything up to you know, five, 10,000 um, with fairly light restrictions. And I think it's definitely evened out a lot more. Um, we're pretty lucky to have vaccinations pretty available across the country right now. And so that has really helped to make things uh, feasible at pretty much anywhere. Yeah, the first multi-thousand person um, uh, marathon that happened, uh, to my knowledge, was Woodlands down yeah. in Texas. And, and that was several thousand people, and it happened at the end of February. So it, it was definitely very regional at that point in time. And you talk to a race director in New York State, and they were all exceptionally frustrated that, you know, they couldn't open and, and so forth. But it seems like everybody is opening now. Great. So that's great news to hear. So in terms of um, total registrations, like in terms of like total volume of activity, and I should probably say that. I guess this is probably the one number that's a little bit more susceptible to what's happening at Run Sign Up because you guys are a single company and you know you're on your own growth trajectory. But from what we can tell from the numbers, what are tot what's total registration volume telling us about the strength of the comeback of races so far and sort of where we are on the curve of recovery? So we just did the Q2 report and Q2 overall was down 11% in terms of the number of registrations. 
on our platform. Uh, but if you look at just June, it was essentially flat at about 440,000 um, registrations for the month of June. Um, and uh, July has started off uh, pretty hot and it's going to even get better as July goes on because you've got a number of fall races like Boilermaker, Broad Street, Vermont City Marathon, all opening up in July um, for their fall fall event. So is it a combination, you think, that um, fewer events are being scheduled and then the ones that are being scheduled, they're coming on with reduced numbers? There's some reduced numbers, um, but I would actually say we're getting, now that we're starting to get into registrations for fall, you're starting to see more events because you've got a lot of postponed events. Um, I think when we take a look at registrations, it looks like registrations are still down in a lot of events, uh, I think largely because there were caps put on throughout the summer um, where they couldn't host as many runners as normal. But it's definitely, I think, going to start bouncing back up participation levels. But like, if you look at the Q2 numbers, part of the problem was that there just were not that many events opened up. And and if you, you go you roll the clock back to April in the US, a lot of people still couldn't get vaccines at the beginning of April. So that there is a lot more cautiousness on the part of a participant to actually sign up. Um, and you know, we just see that trend kind of opening both in terms of race directors opening up their races as well as participants signing up for the races. So it's kind of the way we've talked about it internally. We've got a lot of uh, wind at our backs. <laughs> yeah. And um, how, how about this uh, much predicted? I hear it from, from everyone. I guess have been telling me on the podcast as well that, you know, there's going to be like a, a big surge of events this fall, basically, you know, like lots of postponed events coming up within the next, uh, you know, three or four months. Is that, is that something that, that you're also seeing on the ground? Yes and no. If you take the top 100 races, a lot of them have shifted. But if you look at the numbers, only 6% of participants sign up for the top 100 races. 94% of participants sign up for all the rest. And so if you look at the normal you know, 200 person 5K um, in a local community that was supposed to happen in March, it did not happen in March they typically are not going to delay their event into the fall and try to be competitive on the calendar. So at the top end of the calendar, you might have some big events that are on the same weekend in, in October. But if you think about how they get stretched out geographically and you think about kind of the pent up demand that we all kind of think is there on the part of participants and, you know, and you look at Boilermaker, they're capping at 12,000 rather than 15,000 this year. Um, and, and, you know, you look at Broad Street, they're going to cap it below what they usually cap it at. Same with Philadelphia Marathon. So I think that, you know, the supply and demand will actually kind of work out OK. And I, I think that there's going to be plenty of demand for races to eat up that supply. I don't think the supply is as over the top as people think. Like, you know, yeah, Boston got delayed and oh, my gosh, you know, but I, I don't think it's going to have a huge material impact on on the overall um, situation. Yeah, I think it's fair to to remember, and this is probably like a psychological skew people have, that the bulk of events and the bulk of this industry is really not concentrated in the top, you know, like 50, 100 kind of like marquee races that people keep referring to. And as you say, although there's been news of some of these high profile events being um, postponed Till this fall, as you're saying, it really matters what happens to the rest of the, you know, like 90% of the market of smaller and medium-sized events, which yes, they they it's it seems like they have a smaller tendency to want to shift to um to fall. So one other obviously huge thing during the pandemic in 2020 has been virtual races. What's happening on that front in terms of, of in-person races coming back? Are they coming back? Are they keeping the virtual components? Are still some races continuing to be virtual? What's the mix on that? We're starting to see kind of a you know gradual removal of the fully virtual options for races that were previously in-person. Um, you're definitely seeing an in-person option for you know most races moving forward. That being said, we do see races looking at um, more of a hybrid model where they offer a virtual race to accommodate the people who joined last year who might not live locally 
or who may not be able to make the live race. Um, they're, they're kind of making room to reach those people as well. Um, I think we were looking at about 80% of transactions are now for in-person uh, events, which is up from just about 30% in June of 2020 or about 50% in January of 2021. So the shift is massively you know, notable that in-person events are back to being the, the, you know, the number one choice. Um, but I do think we see a lot more virtual options allowed than we did before. Yeah, and I think it depends upon how a race really adopts the virtual or the challenge uh, part and how that each race kind of um, applies that. I think a lot of races are going to keep it around, you know, for the next five or 10 years. And it's going to be a nice little, you know, five to 15 percent bump for them. But there's some races that really kind of double down on it. And so like if you look at the the Indy 500 marathon, they are doing this challenge event and it's wildly popular. It's, you know, thousands of people have signed up for it. Um, actually, about the same number of people sign up for it as the number of people have signed up for the race that they're going to have in February of 2022. So it's, um, you know, so it's material to some events if they put marketing effort into it and they, they figure out how to make it interesting and unique. And, you know, the challenge software, one of the things that we were thinking about last year when we were developing it, this is a great way to make your event more than a single day event. You know, make, you know, whatever the mission is behind your event, you can make it last a lot longer with a challenge type of type of scenario. I think it's important to remember that in general, virtual participants, last year was an anomaly, but the people who opt to do virtual tend to be much more likely to be women. They tend to be older than your participants on race day. They often aren't the same people. So when you're providing a virtual option, particularly if you can do a really robust one, but even if it's just something, you know, an an extra option to allow people to join, you're not losing people from your regular race. You're just kind of, you know, expanding the pool of people who might, you know, engage with your organization. And you think that race directors have sort of woken up to that fact that they're actually, you know, conscious of the opportunities that having a virtual option presents for them and their events? I think they're more than conscious, at least some of them, because some of them, they were saved by virtual last year. Like they, you know, they needed to pay their mortgage and, and, and virtual was the only way that they were able to do it. So it's it's very real and visceral for those people, and they and and the ones that were successful with it really understand that, and they're taking it forward. Did you happen to see also on that virtual front, particularly towards sort of uh, beginning of the year, where in person events or the hope of in person events was coming back? Did you start to see from discussions with people? this fatigue that people report from runners of, you know, like being completely overwhelmed and disinterested by virtual events, you know, like after a few months, everyone was just so sick of them. Did you see that? So you started to see, it's kind of hard to tell because you started to see in-person events coming back around that same time. Uh, So people were starting to have other options. That being said, you know, we continue to see increasing numbers of participation through early 2021 so people may have been tired and not wanting to do virtual, but they, there were still people signing up for those events. Um, it may not have been their first choice, um, or it may have been that it was people who you know, wouldn't normally have participated at all, but the numbers were still increasing through, the, through that season. So someone was registering for them. Mm. So one of the complexities, I suppose, that virtual events introduce in terms of the discussion we're having today and the data is that you know, they tend to be lower priced events. And what that does, I suppose, overall in the data is is, is it tends to depress average prices for events. There's been a few questions in our group and uh, the community. Uh, Lots of people wondering whether events coming back now in 2021, the first in-person races, are going to be hiking prices or reducing prices or keeping prices the same. Do we have any sense from the data what direction the market is um, heading at? Our best uh, kind of assessment would be that it's starting to even out back to kind of pre-pandemic prices. Uh, we did see a huge decrease in prices in 2020, largely on the you know, more expensive, longer events. And that is because you know, a virtual marathon doesn't cost more to put on than a virtual 5K. So that tends to even the prices out some. We saw a big drop in prices because of that. 
Um, there is still, you know, we are still seeing numbers, prices that are lower than 2019, but they are starting to get closer. Uh, you know, for you know, a good look, a half marathon in 2019 averaged around $64. In 2020, it dropped to $52 and it's back up to $60. So you are seeing, you know, people starting to come back to the prices that we originally were at. Yeah, unfortunately, it, it wasn't possible for us to pull out the data to say, okay, just give me prices for virtual versus in person. But if you think about that, sixty dollars for that half marathon versus sixty four in twenty nineteen, you know, that sixty is influenced by some virtual. And so, you know, if the if the mix, you know, has switched to 70 or 80 percent, you know, you, you, you put that factor on and it's probably about the same. And anecdotally, what we're seeing is that people like a lot of race directors are saying this is the return to normal. We've always charged fifty dollars. We're going to continue to charge fifty dollars as you come back. And then the, the other factor is is a cost factor where, like, I think six months ago, uh, race directors were having to plan for a lot of extra costs to ad adapt to the COVID restrictions and everything. I think a lot of those costs have kind of dissipated. And so the cost differential to what they had before and now has, has kind of uh, has, has been kind of minimized. I know there was a lot of talk about like COVID fees and adding extra fees for that. Um, and you've seen a couple of large name races do that. I think Boston has one. I have not seen, again, that's kind of anecdotal, but as we go through races, I have not seen other races, smaller, you know, more traditional races add that kind of a fee. Right. Yep. One other thing that, uh, again, speaking of anecdotal, um, anecdotal trends, one other thing that people seem to be reporting is um, a pattern where participants are registering later for races. The rationale being presented there by people who report this is that uh, race directors feel that maybe some participants or a part of the market is holding off to see whether you know the likelihood of events taking place is going to increase and just making sure that the event is just going to take place. Do we have any sense from the data whether people are indeed registering later than normal? I would say the data says pretty much the opposite. Um, we tried to look at this in a couple of ways because there are some, you know, some some weird things that happens when you have races that have postponed. It makes it look like people have registered much further out. So we tried as well as we could to remove, uh, you know, people who had registered in March for a race that then got pushed back to October. Even when we do that, we're seeing about 25 percent of people registering on race week, which is actually down a little bit from 28 percent, uh, 28 percent in 2019. So, you know, it may be true that there are some events that have seen that, but as an overall marker, that does not appear to be holding true. Yeah, I, I was actually kind of surprised when we did that, when we did that, ran that data. And I, I broke it out by distance just to see if like we were missing something and that trend was really true in a 5K and it wasn't in a half marathon um, or something, but it, it holds pretty steady or actually slightly fewer race week registrations across the board. Yeah, that is quite surprising, actually. I mean, I guess one way to interpret that might be that, uh, you know, people who are, let's say, 30 or 60 days out from their event and they get the feeling by looking at registrations 30 and 60 days out, uh, you know, they, they might interpret lower registrations as people holding off to register later, like closer to race day. But another perhaps sadly more straightforward explanation might be that there's just people, just less people registering, right? And then you're seeing your 30, 60 day out numbers being low, hoping that this is going to, you know, come back later to closer to race day. And, and, and maybe it's just lower registrations across the board. And, and some of that may be true and, and, you know, improving again, I think there's a lack of confidence amongst runners to go ahead and register for quite a while. Um, and as you see that coming back, they, you know, you may see those numbers go back up, but it is entirely feasible that, you know, like we said, registrations are still down some. Some of that may just be races are uh, not quite coming back to their same size yet because people are not yet back to regular life. Yeah, well, if you look at those Q2 numbers uh, and you say that, you know, we're around a little over 10,000 races in both 2019 and, and 2021 and overall registrations were down 11 percent. So it's it's about the same number of races um, 
who were on the platform taking registrations during Q2, um, and uh, overall 11% fewer. So people may be seeing that. I think that, you know, as we've seen, if you look at the April, May, June numbers, and June is flat, not down 11%, that means that, you know, April was down 20%, and, you know, May was down 10% or something. But, uh, but that's, I think that I, I I agree with Johanna in that, you know, it's just participants and races kind of getting ready to open up. The other interesting anecdotal uh, piece that I have is that I've seen a lot of races bringing back um, price increases. So scheduled price increases. And so that's becoming much more normal. Whereas with virtual races, People last year, they just opened them and kept the price at 35 bucks, you know, for the whole two months that they had it open or something. That's actually not even just anecdotal. We can we measure how many price increases there are. And it is not quite back to 2019 levels, but we are seeing more price increases. Yeah. And if you if you remove the the 20 percent of virtual, I bet it I bet it is. I bet it is fully back. Is that like a bullish sign for uh, the industry price increases coming back? Oh yeah, I think it's really bullish. I, th- I think it's I think it's really bullish to see races coming back at what their previous prices were. You know, widespread adoption. You can say Q two is down eleven percent, but there's a lot of things that are moving really really quick. That, like you know, again, if you go back to April first and people had to stand in line for vaccines, think you know the the dynamic has changed remarkably in the country over that over that ninety days. Okay, so that's um, actually a really, really um, interesting observation from the data, what we were uh, saying a minute ago about the data not actually confirming a um, pattern of people registering uh, later than normal. I think that's that's really interesting, and that's that's one of the powerful data points you could only really tell by just looking at thousands of races and what, what's happening with registration there. Let's see if the other uh, hope of the industry is uh, bears any any um, evidence in fact you know lots of people have been saying that uh, when things come back uh, which seems to start this fall we're going to be seeing kind of revival with lots of new runners coming into the scene lots of people who have been you know who picked up running during the uh, lockdown are going to boost registrations in the industry. Maybe it's a little bit too soon right now to have that evidence, but are we seeing anything in the data or in discussions with people on the ground about new blood coming into races? It's interesting to see what's happening, and it's all over the map, right? There, there are some events that just did not survive through the pandemic, um, and, um, and there are new events that are starting up like we just had a ton of nonprofit um, new customers come to us for virtual events last year because their galas got canceled. And now they're sticking around not only for a virtual, but they're going to put a, a real uh, race on and, and things like that. And it's uh, so there's that new blood. And then my other observation is that there were people who were aggressive over the over the pandemic time, put themselves in a strong position to come back quickly and with the intention of taking market share. So we see that very, uh, very much in the timer community. So there's some timers out there that put themselves in a, in a real position to grow post pandemic, you know, Big River, uh, race day events, uh, uh, organizations like that. And the same thing is, is true with uh, individual races. Um, the, the individual races that kind of opened up early that have a plan that, you know, like the Indy 500 that had a, a challenge event and, and just coordinated everything and kind of put themselves in a chance to take advantage of all the change and, and be one of the people that kind of caught the early adopters. Uh, they're, they're doing, they're doing quite well. What about first time racers? Is there, is there any evidence to suggest that new people are coming into racing, perhaps even younger people in terms of the age breakdown of, of people racing this fall? In terms of whether or not there are new people coming in, it's a little bit hard for us to tell specifically. Uh, we can compare race to race, like a race from 2020 to 2021. 
But because 2020 was such an anomaly, we don't think that really tells us if this is someone new or if it's someone who just skipped the virtual year in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, we can say that if you're looking for you know growth over the next few years, um, there is definitely an issue in the market with attracting younger runners. We saw a pretty big significant drop off of both you know, under 18 runners and also the 18 to 29 group. Um, 18 to 29 year olds are down to 11.8% of our current 2021 numbers. Um, and that was 16.3% in 2019. And in 2019, we were saying that that age group was falling as a percentage of the market. Um, so there is definitely you know, some, some questions where we are seeing more older runners joining the sport, which is great and encouraging. Um, but we are lacking some of the younger runners. Yeah. And then anecdotally, we have a way that allows um, races to use our platform to kind of look at um, repeat participant reports so they can tell how many people have, have done it first time, two times, three times, four times, five times, 10 times, 100 times. And um, and when we look at some of the, the you know, semi-large races in there, um, it looks to be this year about the same that it looked like in 2019. So if you look at their 2019 data, you know, the percentage of first timers is about the same as the percentage of first timers in 2021. So, mm -hmm. you know, like there has been a lot of talk about that. And, you know, I've got people coming up to me all the time and saying, oh, you do that running thing, right? And, you know, like, <laughs> like. I've got into running during the pandemic and I'm going to run the Scott coffee run. And I'm like, that's great. And, and we've all seen that. And like, that's a big hope. And I, I think generally it's, it's hopefully true. I know uh, my buddy uh, owns uh, uh, four running stores locally here in South Jersey, and they have definitely seen an increase in the number of, you know, runners buying shoes. It's good, but I don't know that we see hard data yet to see it impacting and, going to overwhelm our start lines, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, well, indeed, I, I think in terms of um, in terms of what the hard data um, says, as Johanna was saying earlier, it's not particularly encouraging. And actually, that's a trend that's transcended the pandemic, that the industry continues to struggle to attract younger people into racing. And, you know, Johanna was saying, which I suppose is the positive spin on it, that we see from the data because in 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 the in the um, older age groups, you know, the older age group percentages are growing. You know that that could just be that it's still me and you, Johanna, and we're just getting older and we're just moving mm -hmm. across the uh, across the age brackets there. So, do you guys? I, I know this is not a pandemic related question, but I'm curious. Do you have any any kind of like thoughts on why it is that the industry is, is failing? to do a better job in attracting younger people into the market? Like, is it is it a, a lack of innovation, of imaginative formats? Like, what do you think it is? Yeah, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's a matter of reaching out to certain communities. And I feel like, you know, there's a number of races that, um, you know, are put together by old guys like me. <laughs> You know, we've been directing the Scott Coffee Run. Uh, Bill Van Fossen has been directing it for 35 years, and that, by definition, says that Bill and I are old. And um, you know, maybe we are not. You know, we're not thinking um, about how we can attract you know a younger crowd to our event. And I think that the industry in general um, somewhat suffers from that. You know, if you go to some of these industry conferences. There's a lot of people that have been to the past 20 years of those industry conferences. I embrace change and I, I really like change, but I know that I can't do it. So it's it's having younger people around and new energy coming into, you know, and I'm somewhat hopeful because this wave of nonprofits is starting to use our platform. I, I see a lot of, of younger people um, that are being the executive directors of these nonprofits or the event managers for these nonprofits. And, um, and I'm somewhat hopeful that they come up with new ways to, to attract uh, an audience into the endurance community. Yeah, I mean, and this is not an answer for what we're doing wrong, because like you said, the trend started way pre-pandemic. So, um, you know, it's, it's not the final answer there. I do think Virtual is much less likely to appeal to younger athletes. 
Um, and because of that, it's hard to know how much the, the, the significant drop this year is still a response to people not signing up for the virtual events and just not quite getting back to their regular routine yet because they missed a year for virtual. And, and, and the data, like, you know, I think we should do another one of these at the end of Q3 um, because the data may shift by yeah. then. Because if yeah. you, again, we're talking about first half data here. And if you look at the first half, well, you know, like uh, under 29 year olds couldn't get a vac- vaccine shot until mid to, to late April. Right. And so, um, you know, a- a- that may be part of part of it as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I was I was a little bit surprised by um, what Johanna was saying earlier about virtual races being predominantly dominated by uh, sort of older than average runners. Like in my mind, I would have guessed that, you know, like virtual novel, blah, 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 that maybe that was the place where some younger audiences would, would, would come into the, into the industry. But apparently that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, I think there's an accessibility uh, to virtual that really appeals to people who might be intimidated by race day or might, you know, they don't feel like a runner or they just want to stay in shape. They want to do something with their friends. I, I do also think it's it's kind of event specific. So if you look at Gordy's pumpkin run, I bet that data yeah. skews really, really young because it's designed for like a young family with young kids to go and do it. And it's been a highly successful like in-person race and virtual race. And they attract a much younger generation. That's the type of young thing, thinking, you know, Eric and Courtney, who, who, uh, who uh, created that, they're younger people. They came up with this brilliant idea that has attracted, you know, well over a hundred thousand, you know, people to their events. And, and that's what I'm talking about. Like it's that type of innovation. It's that type of thinking to target a certain, certain market and to go after it and to make it inclusive, you know, to make it about endurance, but, but also more than endurance as well. Yeah, I think actually, I think in there lies part of the answer. I, you know, whatever data I've seen and studies on this, everything seems to point to the fact that younger audiences view events more as an experience, even sporting events like races, rather than, you know, like people like us who perhaps have a slightly different um, expectation from events. That's why they may have been attracted in the past to all these, you know, like color color runs and runs that combine music festivals and stuff. And and maybe that's the answer. And maybe also that's why we're seeing in in virtual events, which I mean, let's face it, they 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 sort of lack that that uh, experience component. That's why we're seeing fewer younger people being interested even in those. Looking forward in terms of um, what we might be discussing in our Q3 catch up, which of those trends do you see going on? And like, what do you expect to see when we catch up like uh, in a few months time? I think that the data is going to be a lot more real at that point in time, because Q3 data, I I think things are now, you know, kind of pretty near normal. Um, And so the data in Q3 is going to be a lot more substantive and accurate than the data in Q2 and especially in Q1. Um, you know, I think things will have stabilized in lots of different ways. Um, and the data that's going to come out of it will be reflective of that. And, and my expectation is that we're going to see a rapid return to 2019 types of types of patterns in terms of pricing and age and, and, you know, um, all the other types of, uh, all, all the other types of parameters we've discussed today. Hmm. If you had to put a date on it, would you... Would you wager a guess as to when the market will be sort of around the 2019 level? Like what, what, when do you think we'll be getting around where we were before the pandemic? Um, so like we're seeing growth in terms of the number of events and transactions that happen on our platform. So we're, you know, we're already well ahead of 2019. But I think um, if we look at year over year for races that existed in 2019 and mm-hmm. and how they see things in 2021, I my my date September 1st this year 2021. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think by September 1st 2021, I think that you know races that you know have moved ahead and are you know open for business and 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 you know 
and, and operating kind of normally again. Um, I think that participants are going to be operating normally by then as well. So the data that we're seeing in July is, 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 is really, really strong in terms of the number of, uh, you know, in terms of the transaction volume that's on our platform and the number of registrations. Um, that's somewhat skewed by, you know, some events opening up. But yeah, things are going to look much more positive, um, you know, in, in the next two months. That's great. I mean, we're going to have you back uh, around that time. So, you know, we'll be able to uh, go over those predictions then. I think that's been uh, super helpful, actually. I mean, you know, we, we did, we're trying to to unravel very uh, complex data and hopefully we didn't get ahead of ourselves in terms of some of the conclusions we've drawn here with the, with the limited data that we have even on, on those questions. I hope it's been a fairly useful session for everyone listening in. One last thing, you guys are still uh, going ahead with both a summer symposium, which is going to be virtual this July uh, 21st, 22nd, and then a winter symposium, hopefully, fingers crossed, in person in Florida in January. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what we should expect from the virtual, the hopefully the last virtual symposium this summer? Yeah, the last, at least the last forced virtual uh, symposium. Um, yeah, I mean, we're looking, you know, kind of our goal with doing these throughout the year has been to provide really timely education. So we're trying to watch what's happening with races and what, you know, the, what are the tools that they really need right now. So we did a lot of training on virtual and hybrid events before. Um, looking at summer, we're looking at, you know, getting people trained up on hybrid still, how to incorporate a virtual event, but also re, you know, relearning how to use some of the race day tools that have not been used and uh, getting those muscles working and thinking about how to actually move forward with events this year. Yeah. And so like we've, we've come out with, you know, new versions of photos, new versions of the check-in app, new versions of race day scoring, new versions of on-site check-in, um, all sorts of technology that's kind of new and enhanced to try to, to help races get back to normal. And, and, uh, and our customers, they just, they just soak up the education. Um, so, so we, you know, our symposiums are kind of different they're, they're not kind of all that clubby or, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. They're, they're more about uh, learning and learning tangible technology. So, you know, we're a bunch of tech geeks here that try to build technology for the endurance community. And, and that we're just trying to pass along what, what we've learned from others and, and systematize it and, and make it available for everybody. Hmm. And obviously, you know, you, um, I guess this was these symposiums were originally conceived as something for your own customers, and you have you know plenty of those to to uh, to keep busy with this. But do you think there is value in uh, non uh, give sign up run sign up customers joining these educational sessions? I think there is because you know um, a lot of different platforms out there they'll have at least part of what we have. And um, you'll learn about different approaches of how to market better, how to operate better on race day, you know, how you can incorporate photos as part of, you know, uh, your marketing um, efforts and how, how do you differentiate and really hang on to people, um, you know, challenge platforms. There's plenty of challenge platforms out there, so you don't necessarily need to, to use ours, but you'll hear great stories about how how people are, are, you know, really utilizing a challenge type of a platform to elongate their engagement cycles with their customers and to increase their revenue. Okay. And is the price, um, am I right in saying it's like $30 or something, right? To join the... It is free, even better. It's free. Yeah. The, the virtual, this virtual one is free. Oh, absolutely free because I was on the site just now and I thought that it's just the first 200 people or something. Is it free for everyone, for anyone that joins? Yep. It's free. Okay, that's a pretty, it's a pretty, it's a pretty attractive yeah, price. I think that, that thirty dollars might be a marketing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, that's that sounds like a winning proposition because, as as Bob was saying, yes. I mean, you know, you're going to be talking about some things from a run sign up um, implementation angle, but lots of platforms have similar features, and there's definitely, I think, an opportunity there for people to spend the last downtime they might have this summer. Uh, you know getting prepped up for the for the full season ahead. I think that's all from me, guys. I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time to adapt all the reporting tools you have so we could get some data out for people to share this summer. 
hopefully we'll be making this a regular occasion and I, I'll see you again uh, back on the podcast in um, two or three months time, hopefully with even even more bullish data on our hands. I want to thank you both and the cats in the background. I think there were either one or two of them uh, walking around. Uh, there are two. There- they are brother and sister, although they don't look alike. Perfect. Yeah, I think we're going we're gonna to put some bumps and slight noises on the recording down to them since they can't complain. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, both of you guys. Uh, we're going to put a link to the symposium in the show notes if anyone's interested in uh, taking a closer look at that. I'll see you guys around for sure in the group and elsewhere and back on the podcast in two or three months. And thank you very much to uh, everyone listening in. I hope you found it useful and we'll see everyone on the next podcast. Thanks, Panos. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this Race Trend Summer 2021 update with Give Sign Up, Run Sign Ups, Johanna Good and Bob Pickle. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com. You can also share your questions about the findings in this episode or anything else in our Facebook group, Race Directors Hub. As you heard back there, the Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up Virtual Summer Symposium is on this July 21st, 22nd, which apparently is free to join. So if you want to learn more or sign up for that, head to runsignup.com forward slash virtual symposium and last but not least if you enjoyed this episode don't forget to hit follow on your favorite player and do have a look at our podcast back catalog for more great content like this until our next episode take care and keep putting on amazing races